Okay. Okay, so welcome back, everyone. Uh, let's continue with the second part. Uh, we will focus now on the different data simulation strategies that have uh, been developing in the last decade, I would say. These are essentially three, as we will see, the data insertion, the inversion of the source term, and the sequential ensemble-based sequential data simulation. So just to recap a little bit what we said before, uh, the use of data simulation in our field is quite recent, I would say one decade, and essentially it was motivated in the aftermath of the 2000, 2010 eruption in, in Iceland, which revealed some flaws in the operational forecasting strategies and clearly show, show it the need for doing a more quantitative based forecast. Uh, many of the developments of the roadmap of the scientific community was uh, set up and was paved during two very important meetings that took place in Geneva in 2010 and 2011 that gathered a part of the, our scientific uh, community in these workshops and uh, let's say uh, decided the different roadmaps and strategies that the community should uh, do in order to, to have this change of paradigm in the forecasting of volcanic clouds. No? Remember that the problem essentially consists on finding an optimal initial condition for the models uh, and that we have a lot of uncertainties and we have uncertainties in the source term, which uh, have a clear, let's say, bad influence on the result of the forecast. No? And the different data simulation strategies that have been uh, tested mostly at the scientific level during this decade try to circumvent these uncertainties uh, normally by using observations data from, from satellite uh, detection and retrievals, okay? So different uh, strategies have been uh, proposed in many scientific studies and, and many publications of increasing complexity, starting from the simplest one, which is that insertion and moving, moving then towards more sophisticated uh, uh, data simulation strategies such as uh, the inversion of the source term or the ensemble based. I have to say that nonetheless, there has been a lot of progress at a scientific level, but the, the transfer of all these uh, strategies into uh, operational forecast setups is quite slow. And uh, we are still on it for, for several reasons that we will discuss. So let's start with that insertion, which is the first uh, modeling data simulation strategy. This is the simplest one, and the idea is very simple. It just consists on giving this initial condition uh, by means of defining a, a virtual source away from the volcano and, and derive this virtual source from a satellite uh, one or several satellite retrievals. So it requires to have uh, to derive concentration from the, the, the two-dimensional zenithal view uh, mass load retrievals, and then of course we also need to interpolate. Uh, observations from the, the satellite grid, let's say, to the, to the model grid. And we have to do it properly in the sense that we have to ensure, for example, conservation of mass. So it cannot be just a simple interpolation, but we have to do some interpolation mechanism. But nonetheless, this is quite, let's say, straightforward. You can see here some examples. The image on the left is a full 3D model simulation without a data simulation for the SO2 in this case. It's not as this SO2 cloud of the 2019 uh, Great Cock eruption. This is what you can have, for example, without data simulation, sorry, that insertion, yes. And this is the result of uh, a simulation that uses that insertion, that has used that insertion uh, before this snapshot. Eh? Okay, so the insertion was done 12 hours. So this is what you have 12 hours after the insertion. And this is a comparison with, uh, with uh, one uh, observation, one retrieval from, uh, Himawari satellite. And as you may see, when you use that insertion, you improve notably uh, the forecast with respect to the uh, simulation that had no that insertion. We can put some more numbers and look at some forecast uh, skills. And when we do that, we see that in general that, that insertion improves uh, the skills, but it's far from perfect. Eh? For example, what we can see here is the evolution of different metrics. Uh, probably the, the, Take uh, look, look at the, the red uh, line, which is the, the SAL metric. This is a composed metric 
uh, a metric that is composed by three different ones, uh, what we call the structure, amplitude, and location of the cloud this is a composite metric. But the important point here is that the value of zero is the optimal one. And then if it has larger or smaller values, this metric uh, it works uh, worse, no? And uh, the black line is another metric, is the figure merit of space, which essentially is the ratio between the intersection and the union of uh, between the uh, simulated and observed clouds. This one has an optimal value of one, and the worst case is zero. What we have here is how uh, time series of these metrics for one particular simulation of uh, this uh, Raycoke cloud. So at T0, we have the insertion time, and then we have uh, two days forecast, 20, 48 hours forecast. And we can compare here what happens when we do that insertion on the top and without that insertion at the bottom. No? So for example, if we look at T0, of course, both metrics are perfect because uh, the observed and the simulation clouds are the same. We are just doing an insertion here. So we have a sal of zero and a figure merit of a space of, a space of one. Uh, of course, as the forecast evolves in time, these metrics start to degradate and to have worse values. Uh, and if we look now at one screenshot at after one day at hour 24, this is what you have in the images here on the right. For the data simulation case, you can compare uh, the model, which is the, the red uh, curve, let's say, or the red contour, with the observations, which is the blue one. Okay. Uh, and this is the difference when we, you have data simulation here on the top and without data simulation. Okay. Uh, Arnaud, I am very sorry. Uh, may I interrupt you because it's a very important issue. This uh, uh, data insertion, where you insert it, where the ongoing when and where you insert it, only within the some specific known areas of measurements, or how how it is done. What means exactly? Insertion. Insertion means you have a satellite retrieval, such as, for example, I will this one. Or you have several retrievals. Okay, this is, for example, another option in, in Chile at T zero at T T twenty four one day after two days after etc. We can have several retrievals. Okay, for example, take this one. We have this observation, and we give this as the initial condition. So we don't we don't put any condition here in the volcano. We just put this initial condition and let this cloud evolve with time. So essentially, it's an initial condition problem. Okay, okay thank you very much. Now I got the message because I didn't know where exactly you inserted. Yes. Yeah, so okay. for example, this is what we did in this particular case. So we have this retrieval. We give this as an initial condition. So the model with that insertion, these are the results of the simulation at different time instants of the model with that insertion. As you can see at T0, both data and observations are the same because we initialize the model with an observation. And then we left this evolve and we get this after one day and this after two days, okay? And we can then later on compare what we will get after one day with another independent observation after one day or after two days, okay? And you can see that, that this, this is much, much better. So actually we can compare here, the model with the data insertion with the model with no data insertion, where the model here is always the red core and the blue ones are observations. So this is, uh, in this case, we have an observation in which we give the source term at the volcano. And this case is a simulation where we give the initial condition as uh, the retrieval, okay? And as, as we can see, for example, here, as uh, both uh, simulations with and without an insertion involved with time, we have uh, some differences, particularly here. No, uh, we can better capture uh, this part of the cloud with the data insertion. But I also draw your attention on this part of the cloud. This is all the mass that has been erupted after the insertion. And in this case, of course, uh, with and without that insertion, the simulation is the same because that insertion was when we applied that insertion was only in this part of the cloud because the evolution, the, the eruption was still ongoing when we do the data insertion, okay? So it means that after two days, for example, both with and without that insertion are actually the same because the mass that we inserted at the time of the data insertion has already left the computational domain and we still have the eruption going on here on both simulations uh, after 28 hours, they are, they are the same, no? So let's let's see a little bit the pros and the cons of this strategy. The, the, the main advantage is that in, uh, we, let's say, remove 
the uncertainty in the eruption source parameters. And this is very, particularly in the case where when the cloud is detached from the vent when we do the insertion. What, what does it mean? It means that if when we do the insertion, the eruption has already end, because the, the eruption has end and we have one cloud that is detached from the vent, then we don't need any, any information on the eruption source parameters. In contrast, if at the insertion time, the eruption is still going on, we will have one part of the cloud in which we have assimilated data and one part of the cloud of the cloud in which we have not assimilated data yet, uh, data yet. So here we still have, we cannot, let's say, eliminate this dependency on the uncertain uh, eruptions of parameters if the eruption has not finished at the time of the insertion, okay? Uh, another advantage is that this strategy is in principle quite, quite easy to implement. However, we have several cons here. The first one is that what, what I already mentioned. If the eruption has not finished, if the eruption is going on with the insertion, we still don't, cannot eliminate 100% the dependency on the, on the eruption source parameters. And we, did, we need them anyway to forecast in the future because we need to know uh, the emission that will be, or, or the mass or the, the properties of the emission in the future. We can just assimilate the past and the present, but we cannot assimilate the future. So if the eruption is going on, we cannot eliminate this dependency. No? And the other limitation is that the, the, the satellites can only see, let's say, a part of, a, of the picture. No? For example, we can have that parts of the cloud might be obscured at the insertion time. For example, if we have a scene in which there are a lot of overlaying meteorological clouds or we have ice that is coating particles, maybe we can have a lot of false negatives. It means that we may have the ice there, but the satellite is not able to retrieve and we are doing an insertion with, uh, let's say, a lot of errors in the observations. Okay, One, one important thing in our field is that uh, the observations are not error-free. We can have a lot of uh, false negatives uh, under certain meteorological scenarios, okay? Uh, the second, uh, let's say, drawback is that this uh, passive sensing, as I mentioned before, are not resolved in vertical. So we have a zenithal view of the cloud. We see the cloud from above and we know the vertical mass, but we know only how mass, let's say, the column load. But we don't have any information in general if we do not, uh, do additional collocation observations, we don't have observation about the vertical structure of the cloud. So it means that when we do the data insertion, we need to assume uh, some cloud thickness. And then assuming a thickness, we can have some a kind of uh, spatially average concentration. And this is what we insert because we are inserting in the model, we are inserting a 3D cloud from a 2D observation. So we need some additional hypothesis on how the mass is distributed in vertical. We don't see that from the satellite if in case of, uh, of passive uh, sensing, of passive, observation, passive sensing observations. And then another thing is that uh, uh, the satellite actually only sees uh, one part of the, of the cloud, only sees the fine, fine, fine material. Typically satellites can observe particles up to a few uh, tens of microns of size, but we don't see larger particles. So, uh, this, this data insertion technique works well for clouds that are more distal. In more proximal clouds where we have uh, mass, uh, or a substantial fraction of the mass is in particles that are, uh, let's say, in the millimetrical size, we are losing a lot of the mass in the, in the observation. So we cannot assimilate everything. No? So let's see how we can address these uh, limitations that we have with our data insertion. Uh, the first limitation that I mentioned is that what happens if parts of the cloud are obscured during the insertion time, okay? So uh, we can somehow circumvent this doing a, a multiple retrieval strategy, okay? For example, let's imagine that we do an ensemble of runs and we have, uh, we have um, a number of observation times. We have one observation at time one, another one at time two, another one at time three, and so on, okay? This would be the analysis. And now let's imagine that we do an ensemble forecast in which the first ensemble member is initialized with these observations, and then we just run the model forward in time. We did the same with the second ensemble member. We initialize the model at another time instant with another observation here, uh, a third ensemble member, and so on. Uh, in, by this way, we construct uh, an ensemble of, of, of runs, each initialized with the different observations. 
And then we do that for a cast as usual. And when we want to do the output, we can do some combination of the ensemble members. For example, we could take the ensemble mean, or we could take, if we want to be conservative, uh, the maximum among all these ensemble members and so on. Which is the advantage of doing this? The advantage is that maybe in, if we just want to consider one, if we just want uh, consider one particular insertion time, maybe here there were there are a lot of meteorological clouds that are obscuring part of the ice cloud, and we don't see that. But probably the ascent is different here, and we this uh, cloud, these parts of the cloud that were hidden here, here are visible. So we let's say somehow uh, can make evident uh, or be less dependent on the on the on meteorological clouds obscuring the ice cloud right and, and well this is a strategy that, that uh, works uh, quite well the second limitation is about the vertical resolution and this as i mentioned before can be addressed by collocating this observation uh, with uh, a polar based uh, satellite observation no? uh, this is one example to illustrate what I was mentioned. Uh, these are name, the UK name uh, model simulation that combines six different uh, retrievals in the analysis. It means that we have an ensemble of six members here, each one initialized at a different time instant. So we have an analysis that spans 35 hours in this particular case. We have a time window for the analysis of 35 hours. And then we, do, we run six ensemble members, each initialized with a different observation. And we can do, for example, uh, in the forecast uh, phase, uh, we can consider the median of the ensemble or the mean or take the maximum values. So this is a kind of composite image in which at every pixel, we take the maximum among these, these six ensemble members. So we here have a conservative approach, okay? This normally scores uh, worse, but it has the advantage that is more conservative. So if there was ash that is obscured in some of the ensemble members, when we take the maximum, we will see it. And actually, when we compare with the retrieval at the same time instant, we can see that this uh, avoids uh, the problem of the false negative that, as you can imagine, is very, let's say, something that we don't want in the case of aviation, because uh, if ice is there, we want to retrieve it. No? Maybe we want to be conservative, but what we cannot, let's say, afford is having a situation in which we do not detect ash and an airplane, an airplane is flying, is flying there. Uh, the second mechanism uh, is uh, the source inversion, and this one essentially consists on finding uh, the optimal uh, eruption source parameters by best fitting one or a series of uh, observations. Okay, so this is very similar to the data insertion, but uh, it has some advantages with uh, respect to uh, the, the data insertion mechanism. The first one is when, when we do the inversion, the inversion essentially consists, okay, we also have an observation and then we try to invert this, integrating backwards in time to see which is the best uh, emission profiles, the, the emission profiles that, uh, let's say, fit better the observation. When we do this, uh, we are explicitly resolving for the vertical structure of the cloud. So as opposed to what happened with the data insertion. When we do the inversion, we do have a 3D reconstruction of the cloud. It's not just that we have a 2D observation and then we have to infer the, the 3D, the three-dimensional structure of the cloud. But in the case of, of, uh, of source inversion, we explicitly resolve for that. But it has also a second additional advantage, the, the, inver the source inversion, is that because we invert for the emission profiles, then we already have them. And then they can be used to forecast in the future, okay? So if when we do this inversion, the eruption has not finished yet, we already have uh, the emission profiles and we can assume that they, for example, if we assume that they will be the same in the future, we can integrate forward in time the model and use this uh, 3D emission, uh, sorry, this uh, uh, emission profiles at the volcano to do the forecast. This is something that we don't have in the data insertion because in the data insertion, we just put an initial condition, but we do not, let's say, assimilate or we do not retrieve any information on the volcano. We do it far away from it. Instead, with source inversion, we try to find which are the emission profiles that better fit the observations, okay? So this is how it works. Um, 
many of uh, let's say of, of the of the strategies are based on the so-called uh, elementary Bayesian inversion that this was uh, originally proposed in a, in a by, by Siebert uh, almost 20 or 20 years ago now. And the idea is, is simple. Is they propose an, an, an algorithm that minimizes a uh, cost a cost function that needs first we need to know an a priori solution for the for the sources, and then we apply the Bayesian uh, bias theorem, the Bayesian formulation uh, involving uncertainties in the in this uh, prior uh, sources and in the observation. So the idea is imagine that we have a volcano and then we have we release from this volcano. Uh, a series of uh, point sources, okay? So I just draw here six sources, but actually we have to use hundreds of them, okay? And we then, with this uh, vertical profile, this is a guess profile, uh, we have to assume that, this is the a priori uh, source, we run the model up to the analysis time. And here we have one observation. We have one observation of this cloud and we have the simulated cloud. And then we do a correction, uh, knowing this a priori solution and knowing the errors of, uh, of the observation, we can apply the bias theorem, do a correction, and then get a corrected profile, okay? So the idea of this is simple is, uh, if we can decompose this emission as a set of n uh, point sources, okay, above the volcano, and we run this up to the assimilation time, and then we do a correction in essentially in the mass that we assign to these of these sources to retrieve which uh, profile, because the sources, each one has a different, a different mass. So we solve a linear system of equations to get the individual mass uh, that is released in all of these uh, point sources. So this was, uh, in the case of volcanic clouds, was first uh, tested in 2008 uh, by Eckhart and co-authors, uh, and they, in this case, in this particular case, used uh, Lagrangian, the flex per Lagrangian uh, model with SO2 observation, and they defined a cost function with essentially three contributions. Okay, so we have a functional here that has three components: J1, J2, and J3. And we want to minimize this functional so that the corrections that we apply to these uh, a priori sources uh, give a minimal minimum value of, of this functional, okay? And they consider here, for example, the, the misfit that we have between uh, models and observations. So this is what we look for. We look for the corrections that we have to apply. This is the unknown of the resulting system. This is the correction that we have to apply to these, these sources. Uh, knowing the a priori, the a priori error, uh, trying also to minimize the deviation from this a priori value. And in this case, they also impose by definition that uh, the resulting uh, distribution uh, has a minimum deviation from, from the smoothness. No? So I, I, the, the point here is that, okay, you have a, a, a linear system of equations that you have to minimize to find the correction in order to get uh, the best vertical, the, the vertical profile that minimizes uh, the, the observation uh, error, okay? So yes, as I said, these results, at the end, you have to solve one forward model and one linear system of, of equations that gives you the increment with respect to the a priori solution that you have assumed. And this is more or less what, what you can get, no? These are, for example, results for this particular uh, case. They apply at least to uh, one eruption in, in Africa for an SO2 cloud. And just to give you an idea, for example, this is uh, the height versus, uh, so mass, the distribution of, of, of mass in tons, uh, in tons per, per second, sorry, the error, versus altitude. So essentially the vertical emission profile. And this is the a priori so, uh, solution that they observe. Then with this solution, you integrate forward in time the model up to the analysis time. Then you compare with, compare with the satellites, solve uh, all these, minimize this functional there, and then you get the corrections. And depending on the type of observation that you use, these are different results for different satellite platforms. You get a correction of this initial profile and you get something, for example, like this. Now, for example, 
with the omega one, you get the, the yellow one, etc. with the different satellites. As you can see here, this is quite difficult to get uh, without doing this inversion because uh, the emission profile is quite, uh, let's say, particular. You have a different injection of a different, a different layers in this particular. Uh, this is the, the most prominent one, but you also have injection of different layers at uh, two or three more heights. And this gives you a very particular dynamics because uh, it's important to take this into account because uh, normally in the atmosphere we have wind shear and it means that depending on the injection height, this cloud can go, I don't know, to the north, to the south, to the east, etc. because the, the direction of the wind strongly depends on height. So it's very important to pick or to, let's say, get right uh, these uh, injection peaks because in case of wind shear, this will give us a very different dispersal patterns, okay? And this is the, um, the result when you apply these emission profiles and you solve the model for wearing time, you can get, uh, for example, something like, something like this. This compares uh, OMI observations, which are the, col the color contours with uh, the model, which is the, the contour delineated by the by the black uh, line at different time instance. And as you can see, when you do the source inversion, you get a much, much uh, better results, no? So this idea of uh, applying the bias theorem and uh, doing this elementary bias inversion has been applied by, by many, many, many authors. Uh, and, but, and it's quite, quite, let's say, successful, no? This is just a, a, another example. Uh, apply it also in, in the FlexPark model by Christian Senetal, and you can see here the profiles that you get after the inversion, and then when you integrate these profiles again forward in time, you get uh, something like this and a comparison with, uh, with the, the observations. No? Uh, the early works, they assumed uh, that these profiles were steady. It means that when we get uh, these profiles, they do not evolve with time. But later on, further, uh, some, some of the authors already did uh, time-dependent inversion. For example, uh, in, this, uh, in this work, they did uh, an inversion uh, with a time-dependent source. This is the a priori that they uh, assume. So in this axis, you have time, and here you have height. Uh, and these are the a priori in, uh, emissions. So they did this, let's say, time-dependent in, inversion, considering uh, several uh, observation time instances. And this is how you correct and the a posteriori uh, emission profiles that we get. So you get a time-dependent source, which is much closer to reality. And once you have that, you can integrate again uh, forward in time and, and to improve the forecast. No? Just to give you some numbers, uh, in this particular study, uh, this, uh, let's say this uh, data simulation strategy reduced uh, the root mean square error in the FlexPAR model by around 30%. And this is typically the number that we get when we apply this. And of course, it depends a lot on the every specific case. In some cases, 10%, in others, it's 40. But just to give you an order of magnitude of what, uh, uh, what you can get when you apply this. So when, when you do the source inversion, compared to assuming uh, the a priori emissions. No? So if you run just with the a priori emissions or you, you run a forecast with this, let's say improved vertical profiles, in this case, uh, typically you can expect a reduction of the root mean square error by around 30%. Uh, this is just another example, more recent in which uh, these authors did a joint inversion because before we saw inversion for SO2 clouds or for ash cloud, but here uh, Moxness and, and co-authors, they did a first joint inversion, doing a simultaneous inversion of SO2 and ash observations. And again, here they have to assume this is uh, time, height, uh, and the total mass for SO2, uh, the vertical profiles for SO2 and for ash, and this is how, uh, after the inversion, what you get. So this is the a posteriori, these are the a posteriori profiles for SO2 on the left and for volcanic ash on the right. As you can see, there is a substantial difference uh, after this uh, optimization, uh, let's say, procedure. No? You, you are here um, able to have uh, only uh, vertical profiles 
with a much, much uh, higher resolution, and this improved uh, substantially the forecast. Uh, just a comment is that this elementary variation that uh, in which you need to release a number of point solves and integrate this in, uh, in time, this is very, very optimal for Lagrangian models because you just need to integrate uh, the model uh, one, mo one model run uh, in time and to the analysis time. But uh, the question is what happened with uh, Eulerian models? Because remember that here in the analysis, we need to know uh, identify every pixel at, at each pixel of the of the simulated cloud we need let's say to identify uh, the original source contribution this is quite easy in the case of Lagrangian formulations because we can tag the Lagrangian particles of the Lagrangian path and then uh, in the in the analysis time we know exactly the contribution from each of them but this is not true in, in in Eulerian models, because there we don't have paths, we have read points, and we don't know, uh, given the concentration at the point, we don't know how to, let's say, the different contributions of the elementary points. So, in other words, to make it simple, in the Lagrangian models, we just need to run one single forward modeling, but in, in the Eulerian, the situation is much worse, and we need to run, if we have 100 sources, we have to run 100 model simulations with one single point source and then combine them. So this is not, is of course, it's, it's far from, from optimal, no? And because of these limitations for data, for, for applying this Bayesian formulation in Eulerian formulations, some authors introduce a very different uh, source inversion approach that is valid also for Eulerian models and that's, that does not rely on, on, on the Bayesian formulation, no? And here the idea is, okay, uh, we could uh, characterize this emission profile uh, by means of uh, some known functions that depend on, on parameters, and we can do uh, an ensemble of runs, run these ensembles, okay, and then try to find uh, pattern correlations as a measure of the model observations uh, at wave length. So here in this approach, the inversion essentially consists on, fi on finding which combination of these source parameters have the maximum uh, pattern co correlation with, with uh, images. And this has several advantages because uh, first of all, we don't need any assumption on the uncertainties on the model and on the observation, but this is something remember that in the Bayesian approach, we also need to know uh, some, okay, we have to bound the errors and give the uncertainties the uncertainties of both model and observations. Here we don't need that. Here we are doing an ensemble uh, that explores uh, the range of values of the different parameters. And then for each ensemble member, we find a kind of pattern correlation, how, how correlated is the simulation with the observations. And we can rank the different ensemble members and find the combination of ensemble members that give the optimal uh, pattern, okay? But not only, apart from that, from finding this uh, optimal, let's say, combination of ensemble members, we can also run them and we can then do the forecast with a subset of the ensemble members. For example, we can, during the analysis time, maybe we can run with, I don't know, 100 or 1,000 ensemble members, do these uh, forward runs, then do the simulation, find which are the 10 better ensemble members or the 20 or the number you want, and then do the forecast <clears throat> with a limited subset of, of uh, ensemble members, which is more optimal in terms of, uh, it's more computationally optimal. No? So this, for example, <clears throat> some results that uh, these authors uh, obtained uh, after applying this uh, pattern versus inversion strategy for the source term using the high split model uh, driven by the, the access regional uh, meteorological model, the Australian model. And uh, on the left, you see retrievals at different time instants. And here you can see the, this optimal uh, combination of ensemble members that give uh, the better fit uh, to the observations. Okay, so uh, let's move now to the to the last, uh, let's say, data simulation strategy, which is the sequential data simulation. This is more a standard one. Probably you are more familiar with with, with those. 
and this data simulation proper, as you know already at this uh, moment of the course, I guess that uh, this is characterized by a sequence of steps that involve uh, forecast and an analysis in which uh, the posteriori estimate is uh, obtained from the, the a priori forecast. Uh, all the sequential data simulations technique that uh, are applied to volcanic clouds are mostly based on applying uh, Kalman uh, filters, which as you know, represents uh, the optimal sequential uh, technique for linear dynamics and Gaussian errors. Uh, the problem when you apply the Kalman filter as was originally proposed back in, in the 16th is that this is, as you know, not feasible for real geophysical systems that have a high, high number of dimensions, no? So this is why the ensemble-based uh, Kalman uh, methods uh, appear and became uh, very, very popular because in this case, uh, the probability distributions can be approximated by an ensemble of system state. And you also find, a, say, an approximate covariance matrix that, uh, that is given by, by the ensemble. No? Uh, for an authors were the first that applied this uh, sequential data simulation, more classical sequential data simulation strategies to, to, to volcanic uh, clouds. And these are, for example, some results when they use this ensemble transform Kalman filter to the Euro, uh, Lotus Euros uh, transport model. So what you see here is uh, three different time instances and a comparison of the forecast without a simulation uh, on the top and with uh, data simulation apply, uh, applying the, this uh, of the form Kalman filters. And well, as you can see, there are, there are uh, some, some differences and in general, you also improve uh, the forecast. No? Uh, more recently, uh, we have implemented in the full 3D model uh, data simulation system based on the PDAF. PDAF is the, the parallel data simulation framework that uh, allows uh, parallel, doing this, all this simulation, uh, this analysis uh, in, in parallel. And what we do here is we generate uh, uh, the ensemble by perturbing uh, the eruption source parameters and also the, some meteorological variables, in particular, uh, the different, uh, the two components of, of the horizontal wind. No? This is, for example, results for a synthetic test. Uh, here you can have a synthetic true. So this is a cloud that, that we know. Well, this is not a real case. This is a twin experiment but in which you have a true. And from this true, you generate some synthetic uh, observations adding uh, Gaussian random noise. Okay, So this is, we generate the observations. And then we do the simulation and the analysis with these synthetic observations. And then we do different cycles of, of data simulations, and you can see uh, the, how the root mean square error of, uh, of these data simulation strategies decreases with time, uh, depending on, on. And also, we can look at the, at the spread of, of uh, sample members. Okay, I have to say that here we apply it a local uh, local filter, so we do not do the simulation everywhere because it's. Uh, zero in almost, uh, I mean, one of the problems that we have with the simulation of volcanic clouds is that the, what we assimilate, that is concentration, is not, uh, let's say, homogeneously distributed uh, in the space as it happens with uh, the assimilation of other aerosols, you know, for example, in atmospheric chemistry. But we have a very localized field with a lot of gradients, and then it's, it's worth to apply some more uh, local filters. These are some Another example for the Recoque cloud, uh, where we have uh, satellite retrievals observations at uh, three different time instances. And here we have the free run, okay, and the results of the analysis. Just to illustrate a little bit how the, sim the, the simulations change when we do the, this, uh, all this uh, simulation, or the, all these data simulation uh, cycles, okay? Uh, this is a comparison between uh, these uh, SO2 clouds for the record eruption again, and uh, you can compare here at different time instance the observations with uh, the, 
the different data simulation cycles. And again, here, just to illustrate you the, the, the order of magnitude of what you can expect when you apply this on different simulation cycles compared with the free run. And, and here, the results of, uh, of uh, applying this uh, local ensemble transform Kalman filter with different uh, localization radius. This essentially is a parameter that controls the size of this uh, local filter. So uh, in general, what we find is that uh, the analysis errors decrease by around 50% relative to the free run that's without data simulation when we do this, this type of ensemble based sequential simulation. But nonetheless, uh, this also has uh, some issues. No? And one of the problems is that uh, in the case of volcanic uh, aerosols, we have a non-Gaussian distribution of errors. And when this means that we have a very uh, skewed distributions, and this, this we find that this is uh, an issue because when we apply Kalman-like filters, let's say, they assume a Gaussian distribution of errors and they assume also linearity. And this, in our case, is not always the case. So we find, a, let's say, non-optimal or suboptimal performance of the all the ensemble Kalman filters that, that we have tried in general. No? It means that, that when we do the analysis, maybe we can have uh, some, for example, artificial negative concentrations that we have to remove. And the origin of this is again, uh, the non-Gaussianity of, of, of this, okay? Mm, there is another issue that maybe it's worth to comment is that uh, we assimilate uh, concentration but actually, it would be better probably to assimilate all the other variables, such as uh, radiance or aerosol optical depth. But uh, this, uh, if we do this, it's not clear the advantage of doing this in the sense that uh, this would uh, lead to introducing nonlinear observation operators. In the case of observation uh, of assimilating concentration, the linearity is guaranteed. But if we assimilate other variables, this is not the case, and this even if in theory is potentially better, it may uh, yield to uh, some problems. So, but this is very much work, uh, work in progress, I would say. Eh? This is uh, the state of the art of what we have. No? So just to conclude uh, uh, and recap a little bit, uh, remember that in volcanic cloud forecasting, uh, the key point is the source term, and this is very uncertain, OK? that uh, during the aftermath of the 2010 year option, there was a change of paradigm. Uh, before that, we had a qualitative forecast. And after that, there was the need for having more quantitative based forecast. And so we had to face this issue on how to better constrain and better quantify the source term. And for that, data simulation has been, let's say, strongly used and yet as a, at a research uh, level as a solution to, to this problem. And this has bring a lot of uh, words, a lot of contribution with substantial scientific progress on the different data simulation strategies that have been proposed. We have seen that that insertion is the simplest one that works quite well in some of the cases. Uh, source inversion is also very popular, in particular for Lagrangian models, because it's quite optimal if you apply this uh, elementary Bayesian strategy that has not worked for Eulerians, even though uh, some alternatives have also been proposed for doing the source inversion uh, using Eulerian models. And then uh, several authors have also started to explore more standard sequential data simulation strategies based on different types of uh, Kalman filter. This is very promising. Uh, it's a very promising alternative for a simulation of volcanic aerosols. But as I have mentioned before, it has uh, limitations uh, regarding the Gaussian uh, hypothesis behind these filters that actually leads to a suboptimal filter performance. And you need to do the, let's say, to assimilate uh, with a high frequency if you don't want the filter to collapse. Uh, all this scientific progress, it's very, very promising, but uh, we, we are still in the process of transferring this into real uh, 
operational model setups. And this is a slow for, for several reasons, uh, including the, the complexity of the, of the workflows that are required to, to combine all, all this. But this is expected, in my opinion. Uh, we will see this um, implemented operationally in the following, in the following years. And that's, that's it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. You can mail me here for, for, for questions and well, happy to, 